Hey guys, welcome back. Um, today I am looking at how to analyse a film um, and I'm going to use this short video to help you learn how to analyse a film um, using particularly rear window. So let's start. First I'll just grab my pen, see if I can get this one to work. Uh, yeah, okay, off we go. Alright, so how to analyse a film. There's a really good acronym that we use um, called CAMELS. Oh, that's red. Oh well, it'll have to do. Um, so to remember um, all the things that you can use in terms of um, cinematic techniques, you can use the acronym CAMELS, which stands for, well, let's get to that in a minute. So, there will be a very camel-esque theme to um, today's PowerPoint. So, the first thing for you to know in terms of um, cinematics is that films are different to novels, just in case you weren't sure. So, cinema is obviously a visual art form and a film is not a novel. So, even though we consider film a text, um, it's not a piece of literature. Um, so it doesn't just rely on language to construct its meaning. It uses obviously visual elements, sound elements as well. So it's really important that you are discussing those too. If you're not discussing them, you're not really analysing the, um, the piece as a whole, okay? Um, <coughs> and if you're just talking from a, you know, Mark's perspective, Really on the exam, you couldn't score more than say a five or a six at best without talking about the cinematic stuff. So it's really important that you start implementing them in your essay writing. Um, and before we go, let's let's give this camel a little moustache. <laughs> ah, ha, ha. All right. So the six elements of film are called camels. Um, so. That stands for cinematography, which is all your camera work stuff. So things like camera angles. Um, let me go. Angles are a part of that. Might be filters. Um, might even be things like, um, you know, like pans and stuff. Anything. Um, so camera movements. Anything to do with the camera. Okay. Um, the A stands for acting and actors. So all the acting that's going on, so facial expressions, body movements, that kind of thing, but even the specific choices of actors. And that's like you could talk about people like Lisa and how she's chosen for the specific reason of being so classically beautiful or even um, the character of Thorwald and how he's chosen um, to be the actor um, <coughs> because of his size and his, his physicality. Um, the next one is mise-en-scene. Now, mise-en-scene is all the visual elements. So anything like props, makeup, if you're talking about costume, um, setting, all of that kind of stuff falls into mise-en-scene. The next one is editing. E stands for editing. So things like joining the, the actual pieces uh, of film together. L stands for lighting. So the amount of light, things like shadowing, light positioning, all that stuff falls into to, um, the lighting category. And lastly, sound, which includes dialogue. So how someone sounds when they talk. Action sounds, sound effects and music soundtracks. So that's your diegetic and non-diegetic sound. So let's look at each one of those individually. Firstly, cinematography. So let's talk about camera movement first. By the way, like how cute is this little kid on the side? She just makes my heart just melt. Like what a cutie. Um, that actually won, I think it was like a National Geographic photo competition. Um, but yeah, anyway, camouflage, the best. Anyway... <coughs> The camera can move horizontally, which is called a pan, or vertically, a tilt from the from a fixed position. Okay, so it can move up and down. So that would be 
up and down. That's a terrible arrow, Miss Richardson. It's really hard to draw on this thing. Or horizontal. Okay, so like a panorama. Um, so a pan is horizontal. I always think of how do you put a pan in the oven horizontally. Um, and a tilt. Um, this may be used to follow a moving object. So, for instance, um, we get a pan at the very beginning of rear window where the pan actually shows us going out of the window of Jeff's, pans across the apartment complex, and then back into his room. Um, and a tilt is used um, when um, when Lisa is climbing up the um, when Lisa decides to climb into the Thorwald's apartment. So they're used um, to move with an object or to gain a sense of the extent of the landscape. Um, cool. Or the whole camera can move. Okay, so move with an object. That's called a tracking shot. Okay, where they move alongside. Um, a handheld camera can also be used to increase or enhance tension um, but that's not something that we see in in this film so we can kind of scrub that bad boy out okay okay now camera distance is also something that is um, quite quite important in this text um, and is used quite a lot so different camera distances are used to focus the audience attention okay Extreme close-up is our first shot. Now that's used um, quite a bit where you can only see part of someone's face. Um, we get that particularly um, in scenes where we need to see that Jeff is frightened and we get really, really close. Um, we, we have quite a lot of close-ups uh, where we focus in on a person's face. So for instance, Lisa, uh, when she's kind of, we are first introduced to Lisa and she's like leaning right in on Jeff. Um, a medium shot is basically, it's like a, a, you know, stock standard shot where you're like, you're kind of like waist up, okay? And then you have a panoramic shot, which gives you like the whole scene. So the scenes where we are looking out of the window um, just on, on the apartment complex, okay? By the way, hilarious camel. Okay. Okay. <coughs> Then there's a range of shot, there's a range of camera angles that you can go for. So there's a straight on shot, which allows us to connect with characters um, or feel like we're part of a conversation. Um, you've got a high angle shot, um, and that can be different, differing degrees of high angle, um, where you look down on a character. So for instance, there's in this film, there's a lot of subtle high angles where um, Jeff is just shot slightly at a lower edge, slightly on a high angle so that he looks kind of more vulnerable um, because when you look down on a character it kind of makes them seem weaker or vulnerable um, and then um, sometimes we get a really extreme high angle like when um, Jeff is writing the letter um, to put into the Thorwald's, uh, put into the Thorwald's apartment, we actually are shot from like basically almost vertical um, and looking down on what he's writing on the paper, which really makes us feel like like a collaborator in um, the letter writing activity, and also really builds up our curiosity about like what he's writing because it's initially it's not um, clear what he's writing and then as we move into the shot we go we zoom in and we actually can see um, what he's writing anyway um, and then there's a, a um, low angle shot which um, are used quite subtly um, in the majority of times in rear window where it just wants to give Lisa the slight upper hand um, however um, Occasionally it is used quite like dramatically. So for instance in that Thorwald scene where Thorwald is just about to um, Try and take on Jeff <coughs> It's used much more um, I guess obviously so Yeah, so there's the camera angles and they're obviously something 
it's really good to talk about power plays. Now, obviously, um, with this camel camel joke, um, obviously you take the photo. I think I think we all know that. Um, hopefully, you film it, um, and then you can actually make some money off it. So, yeah, just life advice, really. Okay, so the first thing, uh, so what I want to do now is take you to a clip and we're going to talk about some camera angles on that one. So let's hope this works. Here we go. Ah. Ignore the ad. Ignore the ad. Okay, I can skip it. Alright, so we've got a straight on shot here. What do you think? We've got Lisa, slightly well, high angle. I will rephrase the question. Thank you. Do you like it? Yes, I like it. Okay, we got the screen. So that kind of just panned with with the uh, shot. Now we're going out the window, and we've gone we've gone for a medium shot. We're looking down. Okay, I just want to pause here. Oh, damn it, I missed it. Hang on, let me go back a sec. Okay, so see here. Oh, I can't seem to circle. See here. See how she's... Oh, no, pause. Bugger. Look at me fumbling around with technology again. All right, here we go. Can you see how we're, sh we're shooting her on this, like, really extreme low angle? Why do you think that they want to do this? Well, basically, Hitchcock is using um, the Mrs... <coughs> Bless me. Sorry. Um, he's using this extreme high angle to communicate that what Mrs. Pet Owner is saying here is really important and he wants us to place a lot of weight on it. Um, so that's actually super interesting. Um, this is kind of like his way of communicating his um, personal opinions about the disconnectedness of, of um, community. And in order to give it some gravitas, to give it some, like some credibility, he gives her this extreme high angle, uh, low angle, so that she's really high up um, and put kind of on a pedestal. Let's keep going. Neighbors like each other, speak to each other, care if anybody lives and dies, but none of you do. <laughs> See, even here, she's just slightly on a on a high angle. Okay. Oh, I missed it again. Okay, I want her. So, here's Mrs. Torso. Okay, and she is shot again at a at a um high angle, low angle. Oh. My brain is melting at the moment. A low angle, so it's low, shooting upwards. Um, and what it, it's a fairly close-up shot. Now, the reason for that is he wants to give a low angle um, so that she's got credibility, her feelings have credibility. And what she has credibility over is the fact that she feels sorry for this situation. She feels empathetic. She feels guilty. There's even that sense of guilt on her face that, you know, she she's somehow, um, you know, she feels bad for the situation that she perhaps should be more aware of what's going on and this lady is now suffering. Um, so, yeah, so that that's why that shot is there. And it, again, reaffirms the fact that what... Um, Mrs. Pet Owner is saying is correct that that they should care for each other and like each other and care if anyone lives or dies. Okay, let's go again. Okay, so 
then we're back to so after the um the bit of the speech we get a shot of Lisa and Jeff who are both looking very concerned so you've got that close-up shot where they're both looking very concerned <coughs> um, about this situation so again because they're our main characters um, and we're very emotionally invested in them and we um, they have credibility with us we then um, reflect that same that same feeling that they have, which is concern. Did you kill him again? Okay, we, so we got the same thing with Mrs. Tors, uh, with with Miss Lonely Heart. Um, you know that that um, close up shot tells us that she feels a sense of concern and sadness for what's happened. Okay, so now the camera darts back to each of these um, windows. This is a shot of each of these windows, which tells us that, you know, that these people are ultimately very disconnected from one another because once the sadness is over, they go back inside. Had me convinced I was wrong. Look, Look at the zoom in. In the whole courtyard, only one person didn't come to the window. Look. Why would Thor want to kill a little dog? Because it knew too much? Best call ever, by the way. The dog who knew too much. Um, so, yeah, that final... Um, that final zoom in is really about communicating that um, that there is more to it and that we almost can see the little cogs in Lisa and Jeff's heads um, turning, that, you know, they're back on the case. All right. So, <coughs> acting and actors. So let's talk about the A. So um, that all comes down to things like facial expressions, movements, the way that words and phrases are pronounced. And even the timing of all of the above are deliberate choices by the director, okay? He picks the cast. He tells them how to act, what their faces should look like, how they should st um, stamp up the steps as they come towards um, Jeff's room, okay? That is all stuff that comes under that idea of actors. And they all are used to convey meaning. And you can use them in evidence. So you can use what Thorwald looks like as justification of something. You can use how Thorwald goes, comes up the steps to get to the apartment as evidence, okay? By the way, also, isn't that amazing? We have the largest population of wild camels. True story. So, let's have a look at another little clip. And we'll talk about how you could use actors and acting. Yeah, it doesn't really need to um, advertise that. There we go. Okay, empty as a football. So this is the empty as a football scene. Okay, we've got a lovely pan there. Just harking back to our cinematography stuff. Okay. We got the creep in and we're presented with the gorgeous Gorgeous Grace Kelly, all done up, hair's beautiful, her eyes have been a little enhanced so they look even bluer, her lips have been a little enhanced so they look even redder, the pearls are gleaming, this shot is done on purpose, okay, Grace Kelly is chosen on purpose to be the kind of person that we'd have to think Jeff was insane not to slap a ring on it okay because she's so beautiful she's what every man would dream of okay in the 1950s she is like the epitome of of everything that you would want in a woman okay um 
And so it's really meant to, she is, is produced, you know, she's picked because we're supposed to go, how could he not want to have um, married her? And then that tells us, well, he must have commitment issues. Okay, so that's why Lisa is picked, uh, why Grace Kelly is picked to play Lisa. Okay, makes sense? Totally to me. Right, let's have a look at some acting stuff. Got some nice slow mo there. How's your leg? It hurts a little. And your stomach. Okay, hear that really breathy voice that she's talking in? A bit like mine now. Um, <coughs> that really breathy voice, again, is acting stuff that she's doing on purpose to kind of seem like this sultry seductress. Um, and again, reinforce that idea that she is what every man would dream of. So that would be really good stuff that you could use um, if you were talking about um, how Hitchcock plays in and conforms to some stereotypes for women. Happy as a football. Do you love life? I'm not too active. Anything else bothering you? Mm hmm. Reading from top to bottom. Lisa. Carol. Fremont. All right. I'll just flick it back a little inch. Whoop, no, too far. No. There we go. Okay. <coughs> So that Lisa, Carol, Fremont, again, that's done on purpose. That's acting stuff that the director, Hitchcock, has told her to do. That each time she turns on a lamp to say the next bit of her name. Now, the reason he's done that, and then at the end, she kind of turns on the last light, and she turns and does that lovely spin and basically presents herself. And that presentation is to Jeff, but also it's to the audience to kind of go, here is this woman, Lisa Carol Fremont, this woman who is so confident with herself, um, so sure of, you know, her, her life, her standing, you know, everything about herself. She's just got one thing missing, yeah, a husband. Um, and this is what she's here for. Um, so you could use this as a really good justification of how... Um, how Hitchcock actually, um, you know, rejects stereotypes in that he presents this woman, our heroine, is actually a very confident, self-assured, independent woman who knows herself. Um, so that could be a really good, good piece of evidence. All right, let's keep going. Uh, is this the Lisa Fremont who never wears the same dress twice? Only because it's expected of her. It's right off the Paris train. You think it'll sell? Well, that depends on the quote, you know. Let's see, now there's your airplane ticket over and import duties, hidden taxes, profit markup. A steal at $1,100. $1,100? $1, uh, I'll list that dress on the stock exchange. Okay, so there where we had Jeff kind of like, oh, you've got to list that dress on the stock exchange. You know, again, that's an acting thing that... Hitchcock has encouraged Jeff to do um, so that he has this kind of, I guess, like crotchety, kind of grumpy um, guy um, persona, okay, that, that he doesn't like all the fuss and fancy, okay, he's not into frills, okay, so that's all kind of part of it, so you could use that as evidence. All right, let's go out of here and go back to our PowerPoint. And that's what I'm looking for. Don't mind me. All right, let's move on. Miss on scene. Okay, so Miss on scene is um, about a whole bunch of stuff. Basically, anything that is within the confines of the screen. So things like setting. Where is the action taking place? Like, what do the sets look like? What's in the sets? Okay. Costumes, you can talk about costumes, and this text is great for costumes, okay? You've got the fabulous dress that we just saw, Heaven, okay, um, which, you know, it oozes femininity and class um, and obviously expense, wealth. Um, 
you've got obviously the pyjamas that, that Jeff wears, which is supposed to communicate his kind of, you know, not caring, kind of not into the frivolous things in life. Um, but also it kind of presents vulnerability as well. Like nobody likes being caught in their jammies. Um, and obviously <coughs> we've got the clothing at the end, um, both when Lisa climbs up the um, the ladder um, and scales the place in heels and a dress, which tells us that she can be beautiful as well as being strong and independent. Um, and then obviously at the end where she's literally wearing the pants. Oh, and what am I saying? And don't forget the plaster, okay, the symbol of confinement and entrapment um, and the thing that causes the frustration. And then obviously props. So you could talk about the ring. You could talk about the lingerie. You could talk about the suitcase. You could talk about the binoculars. All those kinds of things actually add up to Miss Onsen. Editing. Huh? <laughs> Camouflage. Get it? Uh, 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 no? Okay, whatever. Um, so editing. Editing is the process of joining different shots together, okay, to create meaning. Um, and there's a fair bit of that in this, okay? Um, so you can kind of do it in lots of different ways. The few that we kind of see are this one, the dissolve, fade or wipe. Um, so kind of blending from one scene to the next. Um and that's usually done to kind of say, time's passed, okay? And we see that, you know, um, right at the start when um, Jeff's trying to watch Thorwald and he keeps falling asleep, we get a lot of these kind of fades and dissolves. Um, the other one that we get a lot of is cross cuts. And when we watch that... Um, that scene with um, with Mrs. Pet Owner, we got lots of cross cuts between the different balconies and how people were feeling. Um, so that that would be um, an example of cross cutting. So let's have a look at some editing and mise en scene stuff in this link. Do, 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 do. Oh, it's the same ad. It's a bit cheeky in that. I'm using Snagit right now. Why are you advertising something that I've already used? Okay. Oh, hang on. I'm spoiling it. I need to rewind. Okay. Here we go. Jeffrey so we've got the back and forth, in front of Mr. Doyle. Um, the cross cutting between and Jeff and oh, what's going on uh, with the digging, well, we and we're getting that. actually quite frustrated about about Jeff seeing Jeff so much because we're like, go back to the girls. We're worried about them. If you call Zen, would you happen to get in touch with LB Jeff? So he right uses away. that to create frustration. Might quite a surprise for him. Well, uh, do we have your number, Mr. Jeffrey? He has it. Not. Okay, and we're watching Lisa. Lisa's wringing her hands, and then we're going back to we're going back to Jeff to see his worry. So we're feeling the worry from both of them. He's also looking at other windows, which shows us that his attention is not focused, and we're getting annoyed with him because he's not focused on Lisa. We're focused on Lisa, but he's not. He's looking around for Thorwald and we're like, stay on Lisa. Okay, again, he's trying to create, um, Hitchcock's creating suspense. So, did you see that in terms of editing, I'll just pause, um, where we went through the lens to Stella and Stella does the shake. Now, the reason he does that, again, we're, we're part of Jeff's concern, his anxiety, we're in his eyes now. Okay, and we feel his sense of frustration. Okay, and you see see that feeling of frustration. So it's given us a cross cut back to Jeff to show us his frustration, and we mirror that frustration that they can't find anything. 
Crosscut again. We see Lisa hatch a plan. Lisa, what are you doing? Okay, again, we're back at Jeff looking at his frustration and his fear and anxiety, and we're feeling that. Again, we're like, get off Jeff. I want to see Lisa. Something's happening to Lisa. Now, by the way, the miss on scene here is beautiful with the dress and how she flicks that dress over the balcony and then she'll flick it again. And that's, again, supposed to, I guess, emphasise that just because she wears a dress, that doesn't mean she can't do cool stuff. Okay? Lisa, what are you doing? Don't go... Okay, we're going cross-cutting back to Jeff, so we feel his his fear. We watch her go in. And we're back at him again, and we're like, what's she doing? She's in there. We pick it up again, and we're through the lens again. We feel his sense of excitement because she finds finds the um, purse. Come on, come on, get out of there. She's Ring Carlos home the second you see him come back. We're right now. Oh no, give her another minute. Okay, I just want to pause there. Stella says, give her another minute. Stella has more faith in um in lisa than jeff does jeff wants to pull her out of there right away stella on the other hand she has more faith she knows that lisa can do this um, which i think again you could feed into that kind of breaking of stereotypes of women Now, obviously, all these links are on your um, PowerPoint, so you can you can go back and check these out again yourself if you want to. Hang on, sorry, I'm just... I don't know why I keep losing that. Okay, lighting. We're almost there, guys. Okay, did you know there's not water in there? I didn't. I, I, I thought it was water. Sorry. Yeah, I thought it was water, not fat. So, lighting plays an important part in creating an atmosphere. So there's kind of like four basic lightings, okay? Um, so you've got backlighting, where the main light source comes from behind the character, which is used to create a silhouette. Now we see that with Thorwald and we see it with Lisa, um, when Lisa leans down and we initially thought that she is dangerous, but she's not. Um, and you could use that to discuss things like red herrings from like crime fiction, okay? Um, and it is used, it can, it can create a sense of impending doom, okay? So that is something that Hitchcock definitely uses with Thorwald. Under lighting, where the, sight, the light source comes from below the character to disfigure the face, again, that's for Thorwald. We see that when he's having that conversation about um, what do you want? Do you want money? I haven't got any. Um, and then top lighting. Now top lighting is used a lot with um, Lisa just in the normal scenes where we kind of get pretty close to her so that she looks beautiful. It blows out an image. It makes you look prettier basically. It's like the ultimate like Instagram lighting. Think like um, <coughs> when you go take a selfie, you pop the camera up towards the um, you know above so that and you've got the light source coming from above the character uh, the the person that you're trying to take the selfie of so that you can kind of get this really nice light on them okay and then you've got side lighting which creates um light on one side of the character to create shadows which creates so like um it kind of says like they're being mysterious okay now we've got sound this poor girl. Also, don't you think she looks a bit like Miss Coyle? Or is that just me? I don't know. Tell me what you think. Um, so, sound. There is two types of sound in film. There is diegetic sound, which is sound within the world of the film. So anything that the other characters could hear. 
And then there's non-diegetic sound, which is a sound that we can only hear. Now, there is very little non-diegetic sound in this film. I'm trying to think of any off the top of my head, and other than the credit sounds, I can't really think of any, to be honest. Everything else, I think, is pretty much diegetic, uh, diegetic, so diegetic away. Um, music's obviously super important to establish mood and atmosphere, and Hitchcock uses tons of it, and he uses it in really interesting ways, um, which we're going to have a look at in the minute. In a minute, so sound includes obviously dialogue, action sounds, and music. <coughs> Sorry. All right, let's have a look at some some uh, sound. <coughs> My apologies. I'm not choking, like, right at the start of it, so you can actually see it and acknowledge it. So, we ready? Something I want you to think about is the omissions of sounds too, when there is sound and when there isn't sound, okay, and how that affects us. So it was pretty quiet, we could hear a little bit of street noise, but it was quite quiet, particularly because there was a lot of loud music just before this scene, and then it stops, and it's just the, the, the traffic noise. And it makes us feel like Jeff, at this point, is really alone. Which seems crazy, because he's basically living in an apartment complex where hundreds of people live like directly on top of each other. So, again, that could be used as talking about, um, about the disconnectedness. So when the phone rings, we're like, Ugh! it gives us a fright. It gives Jeff a fright. Um, so, and that enhances the fact that he feels alone and scared and vulnerable. Come on, I think the wall's left. I don't... Hello. See that big silence? We feel like Jeff is really vulnerable and alone. We zoom in so we can see the look of concern he has on the face. His eyes dart around. Oh, we just heard that noise and we're like, oh, someone's in the apartment complex. Okay. Okay. Oh, do you see that extreme high, high angle? To make Jeff really vulnerable because at this stage he is he's stuck in a wheelchair can't walk on his own it's not like he can run away and even though he lives in this apartment complex with loads of different people he doesn't know any of them he doesn't even know their real names he makes up names for them he is alone Now, do you hear those super slow footsteps up the stairs? Again, that is diegetic sound that is done on purpose <coughs> so that we are feeling this sense of tension. Notice the amount of shadowing that's going on here too. It's really trying to create this kind of like dark, scary environment for us. Ah, the light going off. Again, we're ratcheting up that, that feeling of suspense. And 
Jeff slowly moves right to the back of the apartment and he'll go into the darkness to kind of hide himself. Which then kind of makes him look more menacing. a crack and then right have a look how he's lit see he's lit from below to kind of really exaggerate those kind of lines on his face here and here to kind of like you know make him make him look like he's you know like kind of because a bit grotesque kind of thing sorry man comes in, he's still kind of funnily shadowed. Okay. Do, 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 do. Going back, sorry. Okay. So that's really it in terms of um, giving you a bit of a, a quick once over about camera angles. I don't think they're super complicated. I think they're pretty straightforward. We did a lot of work on them in Gattaca. Uh, no, I don't need to keep that. Um, and I feel like most of you get it, but it's good to have a little refresher just to kind of make yourself feel better. Um, I would really recommend if you're not super confident with um, this kind of cinematography stuff, when you next go through the film, which you should go through the film at least once more the, this week, when you do that, maybe deliberately sit with some notes on the camel stuff and actually deliberately look for it and think about how you could use it in an essay, okay? Hopefully your prep is going well. really look forward to, um, to getting this bad boy done. Have a lovely night and um, I will speak to you soon.